प्रेजेंटेड बाय ईबिक्स कैश हर खुशी के लिए काफी है हेलो एंड वेलकम टू द बिजनेस टुडे शो आई एम उदय मुखर्जी in the 90s or before the 90s indian innerwear was almost a hush hush kind of industry all of you would recall that uh, people would go to a shop and out would come some kind of innerwear from a plastic wrapping or a paper wrapping and you would discreetly take your innerwear and go away home whether you were a man or a woman but it all changed in the mid 90s when jockey burst onto the indian scene and in a sense they actually put innerwear on display proudly in the process of which they made a huge brand of jockey in india and went on to become become a billionaire family themselves and created huge with wealth for shareholders of page industries which was the company which had the jockey license for india so it gives me great pleasure to welcome to the show today the man who actually spearheaded the entry of jockey into india became a billionaire himself and uh, of course made one of india's most successful innerwear brands which is the stuff of almost legend today sundar ashok enomal uh the managing director of page industries is with me today sundar it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the show today because you are in a sense not just the managing director of page industries uh, but um, but the man who actually took indian innerwear out of the closet uh, uh, would you say that's a fair way to describe you i i think i couldn't have said it better myself uh, the way you in your introduction the way you talked about how we started what the market was like before we actually came in uh, you you've said it very well and thank you thank you for that introduction uh, uday it's my pleasure well, to be with you on this show thank you thank you and you know you go by sundar ashok genomal so before we started the interview i was a bit confused about whether i should call you sundar or ashok or mr genomal uh, why the three <laughs> names is is ashok a family name I mean, can you just tell us the history of it Uh no no when when I was born my father uh, had registered I was born in Manila Philippines and my father had registered the birth certificate as Sundar uh as my, you know for my first name and Genomal is the last name uh but when uh, he you know he came home and uh, my mother heard about uh, the name Sundar she said what is this Sundar I mean he's not Sundar he's Ashok and I'm going to call him Ashok and so that's a name that stuck in the family but meanwhile my birth certificate was done so all my official documents are in the name of sundar uh, that's how both names uh, came and uh, in the family and among close friends it's kind of ashok has become like a pet name no in fact many people among my uh, group of friends don't even they they think sundar is my brother you know they 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 kind of get confused but officially it's sundar so yeah i think that's the name we'll have to use for your show of course sundar ashok genomal that's where do the genomals come from because i know that the family actually was based in the philippines until that fortuitous moment in the mid 90s where you had the opportunity to come to india but where do they actually hail from so my my father my parents were from uh, hyderabad sind today uh, which was uh, india undivided india uh and uh they my father actually moved to the philippines in 1925 to join his father who had a business there uh and his father had gone to the philippines in the late 19th century and yeah so he's been in the philippines uh, since then obviously came back to uh, hyderabad sin then got married and you know we're eight in the family uh, three of us were born in hyderabad sin and uh after the partition uh he brought the family to uh, manila and that's that's where i was born right and you know i spoke i started by speaking about the remarkable success that you've made of page industries in india but you owe it to that twist of fate in the mid 90s had it not been for that moment where jockey asked you to be the licensee for in india you would not have gone on to build this huge empire i mean you would have been in philippines been very successful but do you sometimes look back and say what an extraordinary twist of fate it was in your career uh uday uh you know that twist of fate and blessings i i don't know what it is i must have done something right in my last life because this whole journey starting from that twist of fate 
you know, everything has just fallen into place for me from, uh, the, you know, uh, uh, the smoothness in which the, the business has taken off, uh, coming, you know, uh, from, from a, a person who's never lived in India, never done business there, uh, the kind of people that I had joining me, that, that, that's been, uh, you know, some, somebody up there has been very kind to me. But you know, that's right. Uh, had it not been for, uh, you know, the then president uh, uh, of Jockey International during one of his visits to the Philippines, inviting us to take on the license, uh, yeah, we would not have been here. We were very happy with what we were doing there. But I remember him saying, you know, I think you guys should take up the license for India because one day you will become the, jo the largest jockey licensee in the world. And we actually crossed that milestone in 2010. Mm. But when you look back, what do you think made you such a big success? Were you, as I described, because you just took, were the first to take innerwear out of the closet and put it on a hoarding, put it on a shop front, or was it quality? What do you think was the secret ingredient uh, which made you such a big success to begin with? There was definitely a void in the market. So there was a huge opening, a huge op opportunity for us. You know, this is a business that we really understand well. We, I mean, at that time we were, we were in the business for 34 years uh, because my father took the license uh, for jockey in the Philippines in 1959, 1960. And uh, so there was indeed, uh, you know, a void in the market. Uh, it was ripe for somebody like us to come in and just uh, set the trend and uh, educate consumers on the importance of good quality uh, innerwear. And you know, when we came, there was virtually when when I was doing my research after we were offered the um, the opportunity by Jockey, I found that there was virtually no marketing. It, as you say, it was it was treated like a commodity. The way you know the the, the innerwear was packed. And uh, it, it was really a huge opportunity for us to just do what we were doing there and implement it in India. Uh, of course, uh, there were challenges, you know, I, I'm not going to say that it was uh, a breeze or a, a walk in the park. Uh, you know, it, it was, after all, our first venture into uh, India, uh, we've never lived there, as I said. Somebody put it very well when he said, you know, uh, he defined an entrepreneur as somebody who jumps off a cliff and learns how to build an aircraft on the way down. Uh, that's pretty much what we did. And uh, sorry, I have, I have these jets flying overhead because I live next to the old HAL airport. So yeah, that's pretty much... Uh, uh, what we did, uh, you know, but there were there were challenges in terms of the manufacturing environment. Uh, we had to uh, kind of like introduce and inculcate our culture in the way things were being done. You know how supervisors treated the workers, the retail environment, which was very unorganized, and you know, as you said, the way uh, innerwear was being displayed in showcases and and so on. We had to change that whole mentality of the retailer, his mindset on how we wanted our products to be uh, sold. Uh, and obviously distribution was uh, daunting because while we had, you know, we were very confident about producing the best possible products, the best packaging uh, in the back end, manufacturing and so on. We, uh, you know, for, for us, it was daunting on how do we reach our consumers, you know, in this vast and diverse uh, country. And, uh, and lastly, you know, innerware was a low-profile item. Uh, it, it was treated like a commodity, so we had to change that mindset. So all, mindset. So all these things were, were, were there just there for us, you know, for the taking. Hmm. And you have been a true pioneer in the innerware business. But now, coming to the modern day, once again, you're faced with the challenges because, in a sense, the low-hanging fruit has been plucked. And there are lots of challengers, imitators, competitors, whatever you want to call them, they've entered the game. But do you think you can raise the game one more time to stay ahead of the pack? Uh, or do you think it will now become a mature kind of an industry where we cannot expect the same kind of growth levels that we've seen with page industries in the past? Uh, uh, you know, in short, I, I don't think we've ever been as excited as we are today about the future. 
of page. Uh, we are, even in men's innerwear, which is our largest vertical, uh, we are not even 20% in terms of penetration of our potential target market. So there's huge opportunity. In women's, we are at six or 7%. In at leisure, we are around seven or 8%. So still a lot of scope. And uh, uh, no, we, we absolutely feel that, uh, you know, uh, the future is very, very exciting and there's gonna be many, many opportunities uh, for us to continue to expand our presence in India and dominate the market. You know, I ask all these questions because uh, people are used to page industries growing at 25, 26%, which is why you've gone on to create such enormous value for your shareholders. But in the last three years, that growth has moderated to maybe close to 10, 12%. Uh, is that the new normal or can you get back to those 20% blind, uh, plus kind of growth rates given the competitive dynamic in the market? Yeah, I don't think it's because of the uh, competitive dynamic. I think it was more macroeconomic factors uh, of the last uh, two or even three or four years uh, that has uh, affected our ability to expand. I mean, you have done relatively well compared to uh, you know, other players, in fact, much better than what other players have done this last three or four years. So those are more due to macroeconomic factors and obviously COVID uh, the last couple of years. But, uh, you know, we we are finding now that uh, even with COVID, the, when the after the lockdowns, the market has come back very, very strongly. Today, we are uh, finding a very robust demand for our products in all, all categories. We're having to revise our capacities upwards. Hmm. But do you think you mentioned COVID? Could it lead to, because it's compressed incomes in, across many socioeconomic strata, do you have a fear that it could lead to down trading? Maybe, you know, because you occupy a certain part of the market. There are people at the cheaper price points like, like Lux and VIP, et cetera. Is there a fear of down trading which might affect uh, your company's prospects? Yeah, I don't think, uh, Uday, we will see that because our ticket size is not huge. You know, you're talking 200, 300 rupees for uh, a garment or, or a product. Uh, so we're not seeing that at all. We're not seeing down trading happening. I mean, I mean this is the asset test, right? The last uh, 18 months. Uh, and uh, we're not seeing that at all. We're, we're seeing the demand for our products. In fact, our experience in COVID is that uh, you know, you know, our distributors and retailers anyway had tremendous respect for the brand. But after the market started to open up after the lockdowns, you know, they uh, they just kept sending us messages telling us that, you know, our, their respect and uh, their confidence in the brand has grown multifold because of the uh, they 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 actually witnessed the resilience and strength of the brand and and our company in what is possibly the, you know, the worst possible market scenario in history in India. Uh, so we're not seeing that at all. We're seeing, in fact, uh, the, the demand uh, very, very robust in these times. Mm. Uh, you know, as I said earlier, that at some point, you were the true pioneer and probably the only player who was playing this game. But do you find that as new players, like and well-funded players like Van Heusen, et cetera, enter the game, you may be forced to change your track a little bit or could they eat away into the kind of growth that you were witnessing? Because that's what your shareholders really want to know. Can we get the old page back? Well, you know, I mean, life can be boring without competition. So we, we welcome competition. It is healthy. It helps us, it helps keeps us on our toes. Uh, there have been many brands that I've entered the premium segment. This is not a new phenomenon. Uh, you know, in fact, 2004 was a watershed for many brands that came in. Many of them have packed up, but but why not? There is a huge market potential. The pie increases even more as players enter the the fray, and more awareness is created for the category, which, as you rightfully said, historically has been a, a very low profile, low involvement category. I think I think it's important to remember that you know we are a premium brand and. Uh, and not in the economy space at all. So uh, a comparison with brands that are largely, uh, you know, where the large players are uh, who are in the economy space would, would not be an apple to apple comparison. 
And uh, it's also important uh, uh, to note that, you know, unlike others, our model of reaching our consumers is through direct distribution and not wholesale. So we, we never operate in a wholesale channel. Uh, we have a very well orchestrated distribution model, model where we sell to distributors and they in turn uh, sell to retailers in their geography. So we are very closely in touch with the uh, retailers where we can implement our marketing plans and have our display fixtures and everything. But, but to answer your question, you know, while we respect uh, competition and, and keep an eye on competitive activities, we honestly believe that considering our position as leaders by far in the premium space, for both Innerware and uh, at Leisure, uh, combined with our strengths, the only credible competition can really be ourselves. So we continue to keep trying to outdo and outperform ourselves in every aspect of the business, you know, be it the product, the uh, marketing, the systems and processes in the front end and the back end, the supply chain, the reach, all this keeping the consumer experience paramount. And mm -hmm. I think as long as we continue to do this, uh, you know, I, I think we, we will continue to try it. I take your point, Sundar, about not going down the value chain, but what about going up the value chain? Do you consider the super premium segment closely? I mean, there are brands like Tommy Hilfiger, FC UK, Calvin Klein. Uh, do you sometimes feel Beige should creep up to that price point and, and grab some share of their pie or that pie? No, so uh, that's a very good question. Uh, we have already been in this space for some years now, and we have some amazing products under the sub-brand Jockey International Collection. We also have a range called USA Originals, which offer the latest trends in microfiber fabrics, elastics, trims, and finishes with, and offers superior comfort. The difference is we are not a designer brand. We don't have a brand ego. So, you know, we maintain sensible prices. Yes, we will go up to maybe, you know, halfway, there, but we will never outprice our products. And because we want to allow a large chunk of our target market to enjoy these uh, products. And in fact, this has been the, 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 this super premium range that I just talked about has been one of our fastest growing categories. And uh, so we don't, we're not, we don't want to be a niche player. We, we want to be able to cater to a larger target audience. And I think we're successfully doing that. Uh, we're very happy about the outcome of the, uh, the sub-brand Jockey International Collection. Let me ask you about uh, the other categories, which is the non-male innerwear category. I mean, you know, the male men's innerwear category, it has been your bread and butter. It's almost 50%, 45, 50% of your revenues even today. But what about women's and kids' innerwear? I mean, these two categories, do you see these two growing faster than men's innerwear now in the years to come? Well, uh, they are they are growing faster, obviously because you know it's on a, from a lower base, and also the women's category has been kind of a laggard in terms of uh, uh, becoming more uh, a premium uh, because the the there were so many brands all over the place in India. It was a very fragmented uh, market, but we see huge potential and growth opportunity in women's and kids categories. In fact, the last four years, we have built an extensive and strong product portfolio to address these <laughs> consumer segments. Since 2018, we have launched sub-brands uh, called Jockey Woman and Jockey Juniors with distinct identities to com communicate and build awareness for these portfolios. This year, uh, realizing the potential, we decided to have a separate business vertical with a dedicated sales team and 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 distribution and distributors as well to cater just to the women's innerwear and uh, kids wear uh, business. So these verticals are growing at a very healthy pace, and we have aggressive plans to expand this business through very focused initiatives. We believe that women's innerwear and juniors will be the largest. Uh, well, well, we call uh, kids, we call juniors. They will be the largest pillars for jockey in our journey towards growing to become a, a billion dollar company. Mm. So uh, 
how, what percentage, I mean, if you look out, say, four to five years from now, I mean, if you had to guess, how much of your revenue pie would be men's, women's, and juniors? What would be the breakup? You know, uh, we, are, we are aiming to for women's innerwear to equal men's innerwear. That sounds wonderful. I mean, that sounds wonderful yeah, in more ways than... There, in I mean, way. you know, there's no reason why it shouldn't be equal. And, you know, that a lot of our uh, campaigns, uh, a lot of our focus now is on uh, trying to change the mindset of uh, jockey being just a man. I mean, even women's, we are the largest selling brand nationally by far in all categories of women's innerwear. But when you compare to the potential that we could possibly have, we are only, at, as I mentioned, at six, seven percent. So uh, there is so much scope, a lot of catching up to do for women's. And I think we're on the right track. What about athleisure? I mean, that's certain, over the last couple of years become such an important segment for you. Do you think COVID has accelerated that trend as people stay at home, wear, you know, lounging bottoms, etc.? Do you think it might have given a fillip to the athleisure segment in a big way? Absolutely. While, you know, while athleisure has actually been a part of our brand offering right since we launched in India in 1995, its relevance, its potential to grow has never been as significant as it, has, as it is today, owing to the pandemic and the resulting shift in demand from, well, formal wear, work wear to work from home and comfort wear. You know, so this has led to a huge demand coming in favor of jockey at leisure. In the last couple of years, we have managed to recruit and serve a large new consumer base for jockey at leisure. And our investments in the product portfolio with some really, I mean, world-class products in terms of design, styling, performance could not have come at a better time. In fact, uh, it was very timely that in 1920, before the pandemic, we actually set up a, 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 a dedicated sales team, a separate business vertical for the ad leisure business. And this has resulted in distribution expansion, uh, the footprint expansion among uh, retailers, e you know, even during the uh, pandemic, coming mm -hmm. from not just new apparel stores, but even uh, the store existing innerware stores who have not, who are now starting to carry at leisure because of this demand that has been created and uh, discovered. And also, you know, the, we, we have e uh, exclusive business outlets and we have a new retail identity, which allows us to hang more of the garments because of our uh, at leisure. And so this new uh, EBO identity lends itself beautifully to showcase and retail our range of uh, at leisure products. And that's very significant because we now have a thousand uh, EBOs across the country. So it's a great platform to display the kind of variety we have, which are, pre-COVID was not really discovered. So we're very confident that with the increased demand, uh, expansion and distribution, you know, and continuing to produce new products and styles, at leisure will continue to give us very healthy growth year on year. Today, it's already close to, to around 30% of the brand's business. Hmm. You mentioned a billion dollar uh, company. By when do you think uh, or see yourself reaching that target? We, we are hoping to reach it uh, five years, but now we're starting to think it might even happen earlier. Four years, three years? Uh, not, not three, but yeah, four could be a possibility, yeah. Mm. And when do you get back to that 20, 22% kind of an annual CAGR kind of a growth that page was exhibiting for so many years on the trot till some kind of slowdown led by macro, as you mentioned, uh, kicked in? Uh, I'm just hoping that this is the last of the Mohicans, you know, COVID after all these uh, three or four uh, big events that have happened, which were good for the long term in terms of the changes that the government has made in the macroeconomic situation, but has really disrupted our, uh, you know, our, our, uh, our sales, uh, not just us, but the entire industry. Uh, but uh, I, I feel confident that if, we, if COVID is behind us, uh, you know, I, I, I see no reason why we shouldn't start to see these kind, this kind of growth uh, figures again, starting from this year it's, uh, itself. Well, this year, hopefully, because we had the, 
the second wave, which affected our first uh, one or two months. But next year, for sure, uh, we hope to be able to see, uh, you know, uh, I would be surprised if we don't see that those kind of growth rates again, considering the potential in the market and uh, which is just evolving. I mean, it's still very nascent. Mm. So you said maybe a billion dollars uh, in four years. Is that uh, kind no, of a round actually number five years is what we're, we're targeting, but well, between us, you said yeah. maybe four, so I'll take four. I mean, okay, it's, it's, okay, sure. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, now I wanted to ask if one billion is a nice round number. At which point you actually choose to uh, hand over the reins of the page industry to maybe someone else in the family because you're getting on. Uh, do you think in four or five years, whatever it is, your son Shamir is uh, going to be ready to take over at page? Uday, I, uh, by the way, I still beat him at tennis. I beat my younger son, Rohan, as well <laughs> at tennis. So I'm not going anywhere, anywhere, <laughs> anywhere, anywhere, anytime soon. But, uh, well, so far that I have no plans. But, uh, no, I was just kidding. We have, we have, uh, I mean, Shamir, you know, you mentioned Shamir. Uh, I mean, he has, you know, obviously been... Uh, uh, in, in my opinion, and I'm, I'm not in the habit of complimenting my children, but, uh, you know, in fairness, uh, as a professional, he has been the MVP, you know, let me put it that way, uh, in the company, uh, a true entrepreneur, a visionary, uh, full of ideas and dreams, you know, looking to drive continuous change in all aspects to make us future ready for this ambitious growth, the billion dollar and beyond. I mean, that's just the first milestone that we're looking at. Uh, so he's been responsible for much of my, you know, who we are, what we are today. But having said that, let me just say that in terms of uh, succession plan, we, we have a very carefully thought through and robust succession plan at, at this level, at my level, and even at every level in page industries. And we regularly update and consult the nomina uh, nominations and remunerations committee of the board. And it's, you know, we made it a point to make sure that they're all, I mean, amazing professionals and all independent directors. So, and obviously at the end, they will decide uh, based on our recommendations. But, uh, you know, we, we've been fortunate to be blessed with leaders, uh, with amazing talent, passion, uh, culture and values. Uh, leaders who behave like entrepreneurs and and who think of the business as this business are, as their own. And uh, you know, with this team, I have no doubt that the best of Page Industries is yet to come. Mm. I read somewhere that your daughter, who used to be part of the company till a few years ago, said that described the Genomal family as a fun-loving family who are into music, paella, and Manila barbecue. How would you describe the Genomal family? Uh, yeah, I can speak for myself and my immediate family, but yeah, we love, we love Manila barbecue. You know, when you grow up, it's kind of like uh, a taste that you grow up with. Uh, I love music. I, uh, coming from the Philippines, I think that that's where it's uh, come from. You know, they love music over there, music uh, uh, that I sing, I play the guitar. I sometimes perform at uh, charity events and of course among friends at, at parties. My daughter, she sings too. and plays the piano. Uh, yeah, so, so uh, we, we are fun-loving. Uh, we enjoy socializing to an extent. Uh, we love sports. Uh, I'm a basketball fanatic, although I play tennis and golf as well. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, but for us, uh, really, the, the relationship within the family and even among my siblings, uh, that's paramount. And we're all very close and we enjoy spending quality time uh, with one another, and and of course now you know uh, Shamir has just had a, a a son who's now uh, just over a year old, and uh, I mean he he's he is my only love right now. I don't want to know anything else. I just uh, love him to bits. Well, now now that you've mentioned that you sing and you perform in front of audiences, that has to be the right way to to end this interview. Can you sing a couple of lines or any song? I, I, I'm, I'm sure everyone would be delighted to hear that. Just anything. Oh, you Come have any, any songs that... Uh... You name me a group, I'll give you a song. I mean, I'm looking at the fact that you may have been young in your 60s and 70s. Anything by the Rolling Stones or the Beatles or the Grateful Dead or even Bob Dylan? 
Well, uh, around the same time that Elton, El, let me talk about Elton John. It's a little Perfect. bit funny. This feeling inside, because I'm not one of those who can easily hide. Don't have much money, but boy, if I did, I'd buy a big house where we both could live. That's fantastic, Sundar. And to another man, I could even have said that you missed your vocation in life, but since you clearly have not with Page Industries, uh, I cannot even tell you that. But it's been wonderful chatting with you. You're a great singer and a fantastic manager, and I wish you all the best for Page Industries. May you Thank get you. to a billion even sooner than four years. Thank you. Thank you, Uday. Nice chatting with you. Thank you very much. Bye. That's Sundar Genomal of Page Industries, and we do hope that they continue to create great wealth for shareholders in the years to come. But I will be back, as usual, next week with another extraordinary individual from the world of business. Till then.